Well, more and more Christmas decorations are going up. More Christmas music is playing. More Christmas presents are being purchased. More Christmas cookies are being baked. And many more plans are being made to celebrate that great feast of joy, which now is only 12 days away. Brothers and sisters, it is good for us to be surrounded and infused with all these joys of the season, which are spiritual, coming to us from the Word of God, the grace of the sacraments, the intensity of our Advent prayer, that hope and yearning and longing for the presence and communion with Christ, spiritual as well as physical, because we affirm that it is good that we are physical, it is good that we have our five senses, and we celebrate Christmas with the five senses. East, uh, East, uh, East, not Easter, Christmas. Christmas candles that give the beautiful sense, the sense of the, uh, of the, the balsam and cedar and the, the pine cone trees and the, and the, the Christmas trees and, and the Christmas foods. The senses are engaged, the sense of smell, the sense of sight with the lights and the colors. Uh, the sense of sound and the Christmas carols and uh, the sense of taste, of course, with the Christmas uh, uh, meals and um, all of the senses. We are celebrating this as human beings made by God as body and soul and rejoicing. And that's the theme of this liturgy today. This is called Rejoice Sunday, the third Sunday of Advent. The candles, you may be able to see the Advent candles here. We've been lighting them one each week. We are now in the third week. So this is the third one that gets lit today. And you know it is a different color. Instead of the Advent purple, it is the rose color. And that's for this third Sunday. In fact, I don't have them here, but some priests today will be wearing rose color vestments, which are permitted on this day. A little accent of joy at the closeness of Christmas, joy at the coming of the Savior, and that's reflected, is it not, in the readings today. See, John is preparing, testifying to, pointing to the other one who is the light, the Savior, the one who baptizes not simply with water for the repentance of sins, but baptizes with water and the Holy Spirit. Fulfilling, therefore, that first reading. Because the prophet Isaiah, in chapter 6, which again, Jesus in his first public sermon, quotes from as an explanation of what his ministry is about, says that he's bringing glad tidings that he's bringing good news, that he is announcing a year of favor from the Lord. In other words, God is closer to us than he has ever been before, and we should rejoice in that, because that's our life, that's our fulfillment, that's our happiness. I have come to bring glad tidings to the poor. Jesus said this summarizes his mission, to to bring release to the captives. In his name all oppression shall cease. If we all have access to God now in Jesus Christ the Savior, then we cannot oppress anyone by slavery, human trafficking, violence, or abortion. We cannot oppress entire groups of people by genocide. We cannot do that. We cannot have dictators or tyrants. We cannot erase an entire segment of the human family from their legal rights as happens with the unborn under a regime of abortion. He has come to set the captives free and to proclaim that we all have equal dignity in our call to holiness. So my soul rejoices in God, the psalm says. And Paul, in this first letter to the Thessalonians, gives us three commands in rapid succession and says you have to obey these all the time. What are they? Rejoice, pray, give thanks. And he says you do these always. Rejoice always. This reflects what he said in Philippians chapter 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again. Rejoice. Always. It's not difficult to obey the command to rejoice. We always at different times have something to rejoice about. 
But he says always, even when we don't think we have something to rejoice about, pray, relatively easy to obey the command to pray, but he says always, without ceasing. Give thanks, well, again, it's easy many times to obey that command, but he says in all circumstances. So it is the universality with which he gives these three simple commands that constitutes the challenge. And he anticipates, if you will, the objection people might give to him saying that we have to do this always by following it up by saying, this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. It's a command. So let's understand this a little better. Rejoicing doesn't have to, it's not a command to feel a certain way. We don't have direct control over our feelings. We have a certain, a certain ability to, you know, nudge them in a certain direction, of course. You know, we think about certain things or listen to certain kinds of music or associate with certain kinds of people that we know are going to make us feel good and other kind of people that we know are going to make us feel terrible. So there's a certain way in which we can guide our feelings, but it's not like an act of the will. I'm going to feel this way right now, and I decide I'm going to feel that way. So a command cannot possibly be addressing a way that we feel. Nor can a command address how things are going on around us that are beyond our control. It's easy to rejoice when everything is going well. Money is coming in. People are treating us nicely. Easy to rejoice. But when other people over whom we have no control are f treating us badly, or circumstances beyond our control affect our finances, or uh, any number of other things, obviously that can't be the object of a command either, because if we have no control over it, how can we be commanded to change it? So rejoice always must mean something somewhat different. It means... Rejoice, exult in spirit over the fact that you do have something that doesn't change. Your relationship with God, access to God, the gift of the Spirit, justice, the gift of justice, as, as, as that prophecy from Isaiah says, the Savior brings. In other words, we always have God. And in Him we have everything else, all in its proper time. But in Him we have the ultimate victory over the things that make us not rejoice. Ultimate victory over injustice. Because, again, in the prophecy of Isaiah, he has clothed me with a robe of salvation and wrapped me in a mantle of justice. That does not go away. He is not going to take that away. That does not depend on how people treat us. That doesn't depend on uh, our financial situation or any other situation or circumstance. In all circumstances, always rejoice, because our dependence is on God, first of all. Now, rejoice always also flows from keeping that second brief and universal command he gives us today in 1 Thessalonians. Give, uh, pray, pray without, without ceasing. Now, again, we can understand the, the, the command to pray, but how do we do it without ceasing? Because... If he means say prayers, we can't be saying prayers without ceasing. We have to say other things. We have to do our work. We have to have conversations with people about a wide variety of things. We have to sleep. What, what, what does it mean to pray always? Because prayer goes beyond words, brothers and sisters. It is not the utterance of prayer in words that we have to do always. We have to do that at certain times. And without fail, we need to be dedicating a certain amount of time every day with, for prayer with words. But it's the prayer without words that we can do always. And what this means is that we're constantly in the presence of God. We're aware of the presence of God in all circumstances. And we refer everything that's happening to him. Again, this doesn't necessitate words. It necessitates an awareness. You might think of it like, where is the compass of your heart and soul and mind and desires pointing? What, what's your center of gravity? In every circumstance where you are, let's say, for example, okay, you're driving down the road. 
right, what you're thinking about is where you have to go, what you have to do when you get there. But as you're driving, you're realizing, first of all, okay, Lord, I'm in your hands. Protect me from any kind of dangers I might encounter in driving. And bless all my fellow travelers and get us all to our destination safely. And it doesn't necessarily, again, even mean words, but this awareness in this direction of our soul. And we can throw in the words, too. I mean, nothing prevents us as we're getting in the car, we're going down the road, we see the other traffic. Lord, bless everybody here. Keep them safe. It takes a split second. Pray always. Everything, every circumstance we're in, walking into a restaurant. Lord, bless all the, other, bless all the people here. And thank you for the food. A split second. But every circumstance we're in, positive or negative, can be referred to God. We ask ourselves, it's like our, our mind is constantly asking the question, how does this fit in to God? And I'm aware that he is here. It's like letting the light shine in to every corner of our lives, every activity and every choice and every desire and we're always submitting it to God too we get an idea that we want to do something we get a feeling like we want to do something and right away the orientation needs to be okay well how does this how does this conform to the will of God how does this conform to the love of God am I serving God if I do that I just got an idea I want to do something am I serving God if I do that I want to react a certain way to a circumstance am I pleasing God if I do that pray always Constant reference to God, constant awareness of God, constant welcoming of the light of God. You know what it feels like when you don't want to welcome the light of God. I want to go do something right now. That I don't want God to see it. Well, he's, he's going to see it. So we might as well avert to that fact and say, okay, well, Lord, let me do the things that if you see them or when you see them, you're going to be pleased. Pray always. Without ceasing, he says. And then in all, in all circumstances, give thanks. Now, there's a lot of things we don't want to give thanks for. But we're giving thanks for the plan of God being accomplished in all circumstances. That's what we're giving thanks for. We're giving thanks even if we're under attack or we know, sometimes we absolutely know, things are not going in the right way. They're not going in the way according to God's will. We're giving thanks for the fact that even at that moment, he is more powerful than the circumstances we're facing. We can give thanks in all circumstances because we're giving thanks for the God who is above all these circumstances, who does not change. As the psalmist says, Lord, for you, the night is as clear as the day. For us, there's night and there's day. There's storms and clouds and there's bright sunshine. There's turbulence and there's peace. We go in and out, back and forth, up and down through all these circumstances, but God doesn't change. And that's the God that we always have access to. Therefore, we can always rejoice. We are aware of it. Therefore, we always pray. And therefore, we always give thanks. We give thanks because we're aware of that God in all circumstances, which is what the prayer means and from which the rejoicing comes. So it's no surprise that these three commands are uttered by Paul in rapid succession one after another because they all integrally fit with each other. If we pray without ceasing, we're always going to rejoice. We're always going to give thanks. God is working his plan out. He doesn't do evil, but he certainly permits it. Listen, if he didn't permit it, it wouldn't happen. So we know he permits it because he's got this. He's got it all. He's already in our future. And as Paul says elsewhere to the Romans, for those who love God, who are called according to his plan, all things work out for good. That doesn't mean we're passive. It means, on the other hand, we fight for what is good and we fight for what is right. But all things work out for good. For those called by his plan, he sees a million steps beyond not only what we can see, but what our enemies can see. He's a million steps ahead of us. Then he says, do not quench the spirit. I really like that one. Do not quench the spirit. Of course, the spirit himself is, is almighty, but 
When the Spirit comes to us and when we welcome Him and when we follow Him, we have a certain ardor and enthusiasm. Too many times, we quench the Spirit in ourselves and in others. We dampen the enthusiasm for the things of Christ, the things of the Gospel, the things of the Spirit. Paul says, don't do that. You need the ardor. You need the enthusiasm. And it's contagious. Do not quench those effects of the Spirit in you. Do not quench what the Spirit does to you when He comes. Makes you on fire for life and for the truth and for justice and for the gospel. Test everything. Do not despise prophetic utterances. Okay, welcome those who are speaking in the name of the Lord, but test everything. Test it against what you already know to be true. Even if a person dresses like I'm dressing, gets into a pulpit like I'm standing in right now, or has some kind of religious title, that doesn't mean that everything they say is true. We have to test it against what we have heard from the beginning. We see this in Scripture all the time. Remember when Paul said to the Galatians, even if an angel from heaven appeared, or even if we ourselves begin teaching you a teaching different from what has been handed on to you from the beginning, do not believe us. The faith is open to all of us. Nobody in the church has more books of the Bible or chapters of the catechism than you have. It's all there. Everything has to correspond to the Word of God and to the teaching that has been handed on to us in the church from the beginning. Nobody can change that. So, you know, oh, Father so-and-so, oh, wow, he's a popular guy, and oh, we're listening to him. Yeah, well, make sure that what Father so-and-so is saying, no matter what kind of following he has, is consistent with what has been handed down. That's objective. It's not subjective. It's an objective body of truth. So test everything Paul says. Retain what's good but refrain from every kind of evil. So, friends, all of this is, is part of the joy that this Rejoice Sunday is meant to accent for us because it's a joyful thing to await the Savior, to know that He has come already, to rejoice in His Spirit. And because we're rejoicing and because we're always praying, we can always give thanks. And this is the fruit of His coming, which is ultimately not about any kind of passing circumstance or feeling. It is ultimately about this line from the first reading. He has clothed me with a robe of salvation. His salvation is real. He has conquered evil. He has abolished death. He has opened the path to the forgiveness of sins and eternal life and resurrection of the body. And it's all for you. That's your Christmas gift. To share in the divine nature and to live that life even now. Happy Advent, happy Rejoice Sunday, let us embrace the Christ who comes, who has come, who will come again, who is with us now, born in the manger. Let us hasten to Christmas with the fullness of Advent joy. Amen.